The first cannons, also called mouths of fire, appeared in the 14th century. Made from strips of wrought iron assembled by hand, it wasn't rare for them to explode on firing. So, for a long time, people were reluctant to load these weapons onto ships. In the 15th century, cannon manufacturing methods improved. Made from a new bronze alloy, they became safer and more precise. They were installed in large numbers on sailing ships with high freeboard, or height above the water. Unlike galleys, they had no oars, and so had space for artillery weapons along their sides. So began a new era, that of sailing ships and their powerful artillery, which were to dominate the seas for the next three centuries and change the art of war. The history of these warships began in the late Middle Ages. It started in the late 15th century and early 16th century with the appearance of the galleon, which was very archaic. It was quite a big, rounded, bulging ship with castles fore and aft. The wide decks could take a large number of artillery weapons. However, their weight raised the ship's center of gravity and destabilized it. The solution was found in the late 15th century with a simple but revolutionary idea, the invention of the gun port. The gun port was a rectangle of wood which the shipwrights cut into the hull. When the gun port was closed, you couldn't distinguish it from the rest of the hull. Then in battle, you raised this sort of shutter. You pushed the barrel into the hole, loaded the cannonball, and fired. The introduction of the gun port was fundamental. If the cannons had stayed on the decks, it would have been impossible to increase their weight because of the ship's stability. If you put heavy weights high up, obviously the ship will have a tendency to list or even to sink. Placing the cannons below decks lowered the center of gravity and therefore you could increase the weight and also the caliber of the cannons. The caliber of the artillery progressed rapidly. In 1638, the largest cannon was a 12-pounder. It fired a cannonball weighing six kilos. Seven years later, the 18-pounder cannon appeared. And in 1682, the most powerful piece of artillery was made with a caliber of 36 pounds. This three-meter-long colossus fired a cannonball weighing 18 kilos over 300 meters. The cannon alone weighed three and a half tons. With all the equipment, it was closer to six or seven tons. So it was huge, and that was why 15 men were needed to service each 36-pounder. Cannons of the same caliber were installed in batteries. The lightest were positioned on the upper deck and the heaviest on the lower deck. Each battery was made up of two broadsides, one on either side. At the end of the 17th century, the larger ships had up to three batteries, giving them the impressive number of 100 cannons. As these ships were more stable than galleys, the cannons were more effective. They could fire further and with more precision. They could fire further because they were higher in the water, so that's ballistics. And they could have more precision because as the platform was more stable, they could be aimed more accurately. Combat at sea was changing. They weren't trying to board each other's ships anymore. They weren't trying to get close to each other. On the contrary, they were keeping at a distance and fighting in what would become the famous line of battle, which developed in the late 17th century and would continue in all its glory until the end of the 18th century. From 1664, boarding, with its risky outcome, gave place to the tactic known as line of battle. You had about 40 or 50 ships divided into three groups, the vanguard, the battle corps, and the rear guard, which had to fight the enemy in the same way. And the two squadrons sailed past each other, then turned around and did the same in the other direction. 
So, you had battles lasting 10 or even 12 hours. You weren't seeking to systematically destroy the others. You wanted them to retreat, showing that you were the strongest. You occupied that area, and you were sovereign in that particular place. This war of intimidation involved the most powerfully armed ships, the ships of the Lion. In the vanguard were the ships with three decks and more than 80 cannons. In the middle, the ships with 50 to 68 cannons, and in the rear, those with fewer than 50 cannons. In the line of battle, you obviously tried to have the ships following each other, with the same nautical performance and approximately the same firepower, so you didn't create a weakness in the line. You need to try to imagine a sort of great fortification in which you systematically placed cannons of the same power. For the larger ships of the line, cannons and cannonballs combined exceeded 300 tons. That significant weight meant that the design of the ships had to be revised. If you place a lot of artillery in the hull, what do you have to do? You have to make the hull longer, or else you won't have enough space for the cannons, and you won't have enough space to operate the cannons. So you make it longer. But as you lengthen the ship, you also need to make it wider, because if you make it too long, it will become fragile and will have poor nautical qualities. So you have to increase its width. If you do that, you also have to increase the size of the masts. So you need to find larger timber with a greater diameter. The French Navy, like its foreign competitors, wanted to construct the best warship. Today, warships go through a long development phase. Armaments, speed and maneuverability are considered in response to the needs of modern warfare. We have very powerful software which allows us to design the ship in three dimensions and very quickly to be able to integrate all the equipment and systems on board the ship. Steel hull, propulsion system, electrical and computing networks are built in at the shipyards. These ships are meticulously assembled using gigantic cranes 104 meters tall equivalent to a 35-storey building, and gantry cranes capable of lifting 300 tonnes or 15 trucks at the same time. 